has been doing a phenomenal job of teaching um, every week faithfully and delivering sound doctrine. Amen. It's just it's the empowered people of God. So we're so grateful for that. And we want to encourage you to be a part of that. We are grateful. Listen, why are you in your living room? Why don't you just begin to tell me? If you're in your living room by yourself, just put in the atmosphere. Just, just put in the atmosphere. I thank God. I thank God. For being so amazing. For being so amazing. This week and the next few weeks to follow, today I'm starting a series called Faith. And I want you to tune in as we unpack what it means to be thankful and what that actually looks like practically and how that is a weapon against the enemy. Because the enemy cannot beat someone who's thankful to their God. And so we encourage you to tune in over the next several weeks as we entitle this series, Thankful. And as we go through the next few weeks, covering what that means. I want to thank you all for being in this worship experience. And we want to believe God that the best is the way that you God bless you.
We serve a God who is amazing. And I'm so glad to know that he's never called off guard by anything that I am. That he knows the beginning and the end. That my life is in his peripheral vision. That there's nothing in my life that he wasn't aware of. But yet I'm most grateful to know that we sent his son Jesus to die. That I could be saved from eternal damnation. Anybody in here glad about that? Amen. I mean, when you start talking like that, that gets down to the purposes of what you believe. It's been past the shouting, past the hollering, past all of that. Anybody that's glad to be saved? Amen. Doesn't that just get you excited oh, and yeah. to know that? Now 
nourished from things that are without, but you're nourished by what's on the inside. So if it does not rain, you're not looking for the water on the outside to feed you, but you're, you're drawing from a well that is from within you. In other words, it's not what you possess. It's not where you work. It's not your status. It's not whether or not you're a Democrat or Republican. It's not whether you're black or whether you're not white. That will make you happy, but it's what you think about it. For the scripture teaches us in Proverbs 23 and 7, it says what you think about um, is, 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 well, let me say this before I go there. What you think about, what you understand, is not just a matter of what's in your head, but it's also what's in your heart. For Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinketh, it is hard. So is he in Luke chapter 10, in chapter 6, verse 25, and he said, out of the abundance of the heart. What? Um, the U.S. International says, uh, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth is going to speak. Therefore, a grateful heart is the beginning of greatness. It is an expression of humility. It is a foundation for development for the virtues uh, such as prayer and faith and courage and contentment. You, when you really understand this principle, people will be sitting around looking at you wondering, how do you have peace with all this that's going on today? But what they don't understand is that you have to sometimes think yourself happy. In the book of Acts, in the book of Acts, the 26th chapter, the second verse, you'll find where the apostle Paul is standing in front of the I got divorced unexpectedly, and I'm like, now what am I going to do next? He was the 
breadwinner, she was the breadwinner. What am I going to do next? I might have to put you in a situation to where you said, what am I going to do next? Yes. What am I supposed to do now that, that, that things are not going the way I planned them to be? What am I supposed to do next? And if you haven't lived long enough, life will put you in a place to where you've got to ask the question, yes. what am I supposed to do next? Yes. Have you ever faced some life-changing uh, situation that it made you ask, what am I supposed to do next? Maybe, maybe it was when you graduated from college and you received the degree or the job didn't come as quick as you thought it, and you're like, what am I supposed to do next? Sometimes life will put us where we ask, what do I have, what am I supposed to do next? I, I sent them to the best schools. I've done everything I could to raise him, and now he's turning out, or she's turning out in a way that I didn't see coming. What am I supposed to do next? They keep calling me to the schoolhouse about this. What am I supposed to do next? I taught him, I trained him in the way that the scripture said I should go. I trained him, but here's the good news that if you train him in the way that you go, that's what not the part of
told you I got something to tell you today. He, in this text, we approach this text that is a conversation that is already in progress. This is a conversation that is already in progress, but it is also a hostile environment. You know, there's a Riverside revival going on in this text, you know. Because see, John the Baptist is out baptizing people in the Jordan River. So there's a Riverside revival that's going on, you know. But, but, but everybody that's out there, the witness, the baptism is not there for the right reason. There are some out there, you know, as the fair Pharisees who are there to be spectators. They're, they're there to find fault and to find criticism. You've got to be careful because everybody who shows up to the party ain't there to party. Yes. Yes. Come on. Come on. Some of them are there to fill you with on their phones so that they can get with you later. Some of them are there, some of them are there just to see and get what they can get to, to try to meander you through situations. You, everybody who shows up to the party ain't there to party. Everybody who shows up in your life ain't there necessarily to mean you any good. Every situation in your life is working for your good, but you've got to understand going in from the beginning that there are going to be some things that's in your life that are there by God to help shape you. And once it shapes you, you've got to let it go. My God, my God. Mm -hmm. They're out there and John the Baptist is baptizing. And there are some people out there who says that, if you read up further in the chapter, they said, um, um, is there any proof? Of this baptism being effective. In essence, what you're shouting about on Sunday is there any action not on Monday? In other words, that the, that the power that you experience while you're in a worship experience ought to, be, uh, ought to reflect in how you live and how you respond to situations in your life. And so there he is, and there's some there are three groups of people in this. Text. I'm gonna land on one of those three in here. That, 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 that after they were baptized, they asked the question. You see, that Jesus, that John is actually John, John the Baptist. He begins to speak to the formula of their success. He talks to the first group. This is the group, you know, the group that's got plenty. And he tells them to stop hoarding. If 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 you got on two cloaks. If you got two cloaks, you gotta understand something. Two cloaks in the time of Jesus writing would have been that they had on two garments when they really only needed one. So it was excess. You know, it's almost like having on a sweatsuit and having on a hoodie and having on a bomber jacket, a, a big fluffy jacket, and then having on a scarf and then having on a hat with a beard and then having on a, a scully over there. It was just overkill. It was, it was too much. And then, which was a demonstration of the fact that they had more than enough. So he talks to this group first, you know, the group with Clinton. He says, stop hoarding. Stop holding on to all this excess because the real, the real sign of someone who is thankful, the real sign of someone who is thankful is not how much they can get, but how much they're willing to give. It's not so much about taking, but it's also about what you're giving. See, the problem with us today is we don't understand the law of reciprocity. It's all about what I can get, but it's not about what you can Stop 
according and begin to bless somebody else. No, number two, it's, it's in the text, I'm going to land on number three, and then we're done. I, 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 really, I really want to talk about number three, but number two, you see another group of people, it's called the tax collectors. These tax collectors, they were the entrepreneurs of the day. They, 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 and he speaks to them, he says to the entrepreneurs, he says, stop capitalizing and extorting people. He says, why is that significant for those who have an entrepreneur spirit? The reality is God wants you to be an entrepreneur. He wants you to step into things to where you're not having to depend on somebody. If he wants you to be on so somebody in here that's got more books in them, that's got more, got, got more things in you. But he says that whenever you get to the place, don't forget that, don't forget that I'm the one who put you there. Don't get to the place to where when you arrive, you start extorting the people who serve you. Possessed with unfailing strength. 
It hasn't killed you. It's caused a who's inside of you. And because of who's inside of you, it's not your own strength that you're here. But we're surviving off of his strength. In Christ, I can be content in spite of the chaos and strife. Because I realize it's the stuff you got on the inside. It's not the stuff that's dressed up on the outside. But it's still those moments when you're by yourself and you're calling on Jesus. And you feel like you don't know what's the next thing that you know to do. I'm done. But I challenge you to rely on who is inside of you. And he will supply every one of your needs. That's my prayer for you today. Is that God give us a true spirit of contentment. Just satisfied to where we don't want more. But content to the place that I won't allow no matter who's in the White House to cause me to lose my mind. Or because of that tragedy, tragic experience that I go in the time. Father, we thank you for everyone that's present. We thank you for those that might be watching. Lord, we're praying now in the name of Jesus that as your scripture teaches us in those times of uncertainty we need to be honest be willing to give and then be content contentment not to the place that we don't want more but contentment to the place that as I move into my own I'm going to celebrate where I am Father, I ask now somebody that has been overwhelmed and burdened, somebody this week ain't got no sleep until they heard who won the president. See? But Lord, now that all that's over, what are we supposed to do now? I believe we're not supposed to, God, as you said in your word, to hate those who oppose what we believe. But the true sign of spiritual maturity is that even when you, when your candidate has won, you can still show love and compassion to those candidates who did not win. And that we would not look like the world, but we would look like Christ. And Christ demonstrated contentment as he went through his suffering because he relied on the Father and what he said. Bless these your people in a mighty way, God, strengthen their hearts. Really, I pray that you release them from anything that keeps them bound and that they'll live their best life today and live their life like it's golden. In Jesus' name, amen.